Welcome to BBA members and friends. This is our final educational session of, uh, of the day and also of the, of the two weeks that we've been working with this. It's kind of a new experience for us and um, it's, we've had a lot of fun with it. Um, we appreciate you being with us and um, um, I'm just gonna do a brief introduction of Jason here. He's the chief of the specially adaptive, adapted housing program at the VA central office. He has extensive experience as a management consultant in, uh, in analyzing client operations and delivering solutions in the federal government and private sector. Um, he's a former active duty Marine Corps officer with more than 15 years of experience in managing military and professional staff across a wide range of settings, including veteran services, um, IT modernization and integration, remote and mobile surveillance systems, and residential and commercial construction. Um, he earned a bachelor's degree in history and theology from Gordon College, a certificate in applied project management from Villanova, and an MBA from the George Mason University School of Business. Hopefully I got that um, somewhat right. So we'll have a, a time for Jason to talk to us. He's gonna share his screen as well. And then we'll have, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. If you guys out there can do pretty much what you've done all along, um, you can field your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom or um, in the chat function, or you can actually raise your hand. I also wanted to mention we have a Facebook Live um, audience too, that's been probably our larger part of the audience. So we've been, we're live streaming it on that. I just want to mention that and welcome those that are on Facebook Live with us. So um, without further delay, um, I'll go ahead and um, turn the time over to you, Jason. Um, thank uh, you again for being with us. Uh, it's my pleasure and, and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Obviously the, um, my, my favorite part of uh, working with Department of Veterans Affairs um, and specifically in specially adapted housing is getting to actually engage groups like like this. Um, Blinded Veterans of America um, has a fantastic reputation. You do amazing work. Um, so it's an honor to be here today um, to go ahead and speak about the specially adapted housing program. Um, I do have some slides. I'm going to go ahead and share those um, and uh, walk through the presentation. And it sounds like we're going to take questions afterwards. Um, so I'll move through. Um, if anything does come up and someone needs to ask a question, you know, uh, obviously we can we can speak up and we'll we'll handle the rest of the questions afterwards. So, um, all right. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Okay. Um, the especially adapted housing program um, includes a uh, a portfolio really of different types of housing adaptation grants within the VA. VA. And and when I speak about the Specially Adapted Housing Program specifically, I like to speak about them all because really what we're talking about is how do we get the information out to um, organizations like yours and ultimately to the veterans out there who need housing adaptations um, due to various disabilities. We want to give them all the tools in the toolbox they need to find a solution that fits um, their specific situation. So we talk about assistive technology grant programs and things like that as well and I'll I'll touch on those as we uh, as we walk through these. So first and foremost, we have a um, uh, we have our specially adapted housing grant, and that is the um, primary grant that that folks think about when they think about our programs. Um, uh, the purpose of that grant traditionally um, was to go ahead and assist veterans uh, with certain service connected disabilities who really needed a barrier free environment. Um, that's changed as of late and I don't think you'll be surprised to hear about that and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But traditionally that larger grant and it's about $90,000 um, is actually to uh, help veterans have a barrier free env environment so they can live more independently and safely. The special housing adaptation grant um, is a smaller grant um, for about $18,000. And uh, that grant is to assist with other types of adaptations outside of those required for barrier free environment traditionally. We also offer a temporary residence adaptation grant. So this is for veterans who don't own their home and will temporarily be residing with a family member or a loved one. Um, so these situations are usually veterans transitioning out of care um, and they are gonna be in a temporary location for a while. And uh, we do provide funds uh, to go ahead and adapt those homes as well. Uh, VRNE or Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment um, Program also offers a grant similar to our SAH grant, which is called an Independent Living Adaptation Grant. 
uh, many veterans and and VSOs and other stakeholders aren't aware of the at, of the independent living uh, variation on these grants. Um, so it's something actually that we've been trying to do a lot more outreach on to make sure people are familiar with it. An interesting point of this grant, which I'll allude to in a few minutes, is that all independent living grants that were previously managed through the VRNE program are now delivered under the SAH program. Uh, so that was a, a recent change to the statute um, as of uh, October 1st, 2018. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then uh, finally, I think the, the grant that most veterans and organizations are familiar with, and that's the HISA grant the Home Improvements and Structural Alterations Grants. Um, some people also call this the RAMP grant, but it does more than that, quite a bit more than that. And we'll touch on that in a few minutes as well. So um, grant maximums, and this is usually of uh, you know, significant interest to people. Um, the Specially Adapted Housing Grant for FY20, uh, the cap is $90,000 and change, $90,364. The reason why that's such a large grant is again, because of the, in, the original intent to deliver a barrier free environment. So for that grant, we're moving walls and we're adding outdoor egress and indoor egress. Um, we're tearing out bathrooms and replacing bathrooms so they're fully accessible. A lot of things have to happen to make a home barrier free and safe. So that $90,000 cap makes sense. Um, for all of our grants, there's a maximum of three usages currently, I'll say currently, because that's also changing. Um, but uh, so in a couple examples of the volume of grants uh, and the dollar amounts for uh, through FY19, we actually approved um, about 2,050 grants, a little over 2,050 grants, totaling $118 million. The smaller grant, the SHA grant, which has a cap of $18,000 um, for FY20, um, uh, we delivered 215 grants at $2.8 million. So you can see as far as the ratio goes, the majority of the grants we deliver are the larger grant for the $90,000 um, based upon eligibility. The TRA grant, Temporary Residence Grant, we mentioned, the cap for FY20 is just under $40,000 um, for the SAH eligible veterans and just over $7,000 for the SHA eligible veterans. Again, um, an interesting point is these grants will adjust annually or they have the, the capacity to adjust annually based upon a industry cost of construction index that we use. So as long as the construction industry uh, cost of construction is going up, uh, Congress has enabled us to actually raise the grant to match that increase every year. So far, we have not seen that grant go down. We have not seen it stagnate. Um, but that grant will never go down uh, as far as eligibility for the SAH grant. Once we reach a cap, for instance, $90,000 for the SAH grant, that amount will never go down. It can only go up based upon cost of construction. Another interesting point, since inception, 1948, um, we've delivered over 43,000 grants. It's about 43,700 right now at this point, this time of the year, um, for over $1.6 billion. Some hallmarks of the SAH program on how we're run is the individualized attention and the personalized service. How the program is structured is that we have about 176 employees across the country. About 150 of those are SAH agents who work specifically with veterans in their home, um, usually aside from COVID-19. Um, we're usually in the homes with the veterans, helping to identify what adaptations they need. And we provide a very hands-on service uh, for those veterans as they're engaging their preferred construction specialists and, uh, and their local code compliance uh, experts and compliance inspections. We provide a very hands-on service and our SEH agents are very adept at um, delivering the benefit and helping veterans to navigate the process. Um, another interesting point is the Specially Adapted Housing Program uh, is not just in the United States. We actually offer that uh, benefit around the world to expatriates who are living around the, around the globe. Uh, as a snapshot, we have um, projects actively right now in Asia, in Australia, Europe, North America, South America, obviously. Um, 
with the majority of our um, projects right now in the Philippines. A lot of expats in the Philippines residing there too. And we've done many projects out there building and uh, renovating homes for veterans who are, um, who are living outside the United States. So a little more detail on the specially adapted housing grant. I'm gonna go through each one of those a little bit as far as eligibility goes. So for the specially adapted housing grant, the $90,000 grant, uh, traditionally this has been for veterans who are suffering from the loss or loss of use of both legs, uh, both arms, one arm, one leg, um, or residuals of organic disease or injury along with the loss of one leg. Historically as well, or severe burns. Historically, this grant has also been offered to uh, veterans who are suffering from uh, blindness in both eyes, as well as the loss of a limb. Um, this is also a uh, grant that has a, a presumptive rating for ALS. So any veteran that has is diagnosed with ALS, the um, eligibility is assumed and they're given a presumptive rating. Uh, so we actually, uh, as far as numbers go now, I would believe a third of our uh, grants are awarded to veterans right now who are suffering from ALS. And as you know, veterans um, are twice as likely, according to the ALS Association, to be diagnosed with ALS. And they're not sure why, of course, they're doing a lot of really good work out there um, between private industry and the VA to, to figure that out. And we work closely with the ALS Association and other organizations to make sure that we're uh, meeting the needs and uh, doing the outreach we need to do to connect with those veterans. Now, this is also one of the large changes that I'll refer to in, a, uh, in a, um, an upcoming slide regarding new legislation that was just passed on August 8th um, that I know BVA is very interested in and had a large hand in. So um, we'll talk a little bit about, about, uh, more about that in a couple minutes. So under the SAH program, we also have a, a limited authority to provide grants to veterans who are injured after September 11th, uh, 2001, and have lost only one limb. We have a limited authority from Congress to actually deliver that benefit to only 30 veterans at this time. So there are 30 veterans out there who would not usually have been eligible for the larger SAH grant that are now eligible um, uh, thanks to uh, the congressional authority that would be granted. There's also a change with that availability coming up as well as part of a new legislation, and I'll discuss that in a few minutes. The SHA grant, which is the smaller of the two primary grants, again, for $18,000. Um, traditionally, this is where veterans who were suffering from blindness um, would apply and get the funds they needed um, uh, to go ahead and adapt their home. Uh, due to this recent change, um, this uh, grant is now applicable to veterans who have the loss or loss of use of both hands or severe burn injuries or some severe respiratory injuries only. So uh, how does the process work? And uh, we're going to keep this at a high level. Um, but as with any process um, where there's oversight, um, there is a little bit we call red tape, obviously. And we've done a lot of work to actually kind of expedite this grant uh, as much as possible and cut down the workload on the veteran to make it as easy as possible to apply for the grant and to go ahead and realize the benefits of the grant as well. The process all starts with eligibility establishment. Um, so the SAH program and the loan guarantee service in general, where we, where we reside, uh, do not determine eligibility of veterans. Compensation services under VBA determines eligibility. Uh, so they identify veterans who may be eligible for this benefit. Those eligibility ratings are provided to us and we're notified when we have veterans who may be eligible. Once we're notified, we immediately reach out to those veterans and we, we schedule an initial interview. And that's our opportunity to actually sit down with the veteran and discuss what the benefit is and inquire if they're interested in proceeding. That in initial uh, interview um, is an opportunity for them to ask questions and an opportunity for us to actually witness the veteran usually in their own home or at least have a conversation about what their needs are so we can better focus our conversation on what type of adaptations they might be looking for. 
once we have the initial interview and we know that the veteran's interested in proceeding, we do what we call our feasibility and suitability studies. We have to make sure that the, med uh, the veteran is medically able to reside in their home. We have to make sure that it's financially feasible for the veteran to reside in the home. And we have to make sure that the property is suitable for what their needs are. Once we've gone and done the feasibility and suitability, we provide what's called conditional approval, which is step four in our process. Conditional approval actually provides veterans an opportunity to start incurring costs for their project. It's usually at this time where a veteran will actually engage a, a designer or a builder or an architect and start putting together a plan of what an adaptation for their house might look like. Once we actually have received those plans um, and a contract with a builder that the veteran is actually ready to proceed, at that time we'll grant final approval. Uh, there's usually a bit of back and forth between us and the builder and the veteran in these situations. We wanna make sure their plans are compliant, but most of all, we wanna make sure that the adaptations uh, that are needed from the veteran, but to for the veteran, are displayed in those plans accurately and that there is kind of a rock solid plan to actually deliver those adaptations the veteran needs. Um, we do dig our heels in sometimes on this um, because we think it's essential that the veterans get the adaptations they're looking for. We want to make sure that there's a rock solid set of construction plans that are put in place and everything's been considered. Ultimately, it's the veteran's decision um, to proceed. The next step obviously is the project is kicked off. We provided grant approval, construction begins. Um, the walls are getting torn out, bathrooms are being renovated, decks are being installed. Um, anyone who's had their home adapted in the past knows that can be a pretty stressful situation. Add on top of that family members who are, are in a caregiver situation and veterans who are dealing with disabilities, it can be even more so. so it's very important at that point that our agents are engaged with what's going on in the project and that we're there and available, available to help. Every SAH agent provides the veterans they're working with with their direct cell phone number and they'll also have the direct number for the supervisors that those agents fall under. Um, we always want to make sure that there is fluid discussions and uh, conversation communication going between all the parties within the project to make sure things are going as smoothly as possible and if conflicts do arise as they sometimes do and contractual discussions we try to act as a intercessor whenever possible to go ahead and intercede on behalf of the veteran to make sure they're getting what they're paying for with the grant dollars. Once the adaptations are complete and the project is done and the contract's been satisfied, we perform a final field review to put a final check in the box. At that point, once, that's, uh, once it's all agreed upon and we have a letter of satisfaction from the veteran and all liens have been released by the builder, at that point we'll disperse the final payment. Uh, another point to know during the project management phase, obviously, is where we'll be dispersing grant funds throughout the process based upon predetermined milestones in the project uh, that have actually been determined by the veteran and the builder prior to construction. Once that's done, final accounting and closure, um, the project is closed out in our, in our tracking system, and that is considered one usage. Veterans again get three usages, uh, three times to come back to the kitty. Um, that's actually uh, through the end of this year, we've got a little different approach coming up on October 1st, which I'll refer to in a minute. And then of course, the final step is subsequent use. Now that they've already, uh, the veterans closed out their usage, they'll be able to wait a little while as the construction index goes up so will the, the amount of money that's in the grant and there'll be money accrued that a veteran can use for future projects. We spoke recently about the uh, VRNE independent living grants. Uh, the legislation was passed uh, back in June, of course, was made law on October 1st of 2018. And the purpose of this change was actually to take the responsibility of delivering these adaptation grants off of VRNE and onto the SEAH program. VRNE has a, a large staff of um, vocational rehabilitation counselors who are very good at what they do. Um, primary uh, job is to go ahead and find out about if veterans are employable and if so, how can we assist them? 
but also to see what their independent living needs are and the rehabilitation needs are. They do a really good job at that. The SAH program does a fantastic job at delivering adaptations and managing that entire project. And so that piece of the process has been moved over to us. This is uh, what we're finding is it's actually increasing the volume of grants that we're able to deliver through the v and &E program. And it's also uh, increasing the, the quality of the projects that we deliver to the veterans at the same time. We also touched on the Home Improvement and Structural Alterations Grant. Uh, to put a finer point on this grant, veterans receive a $6,800 lifetime benefit uh, for veterans who have a service-connected uh, condition and are rated 50% or more. Now, 40% or less may be eligible for a $2,000 lifetime benefit, which also includes potential adaptations for non-service-connected conditions. This group, this uh, grant rather, is managed through the prosthetics group in VHA, um, and we can provide additional information as needed. This grant is used widely, it's very accessible, um, and the prosthetics team does a very good job in delivering the HISA grant. A little more detail on the HISA grant. These are the adaptations we usually see. It's about allowing entrance or exit, so egress, and ingress for primary residents, um, toileting facilities, uh, accessibility for kitchens, uh, improving paths, and uh, plumbing and electrical systems for homes. Another grant, a separate grant, and this is a grant in the traditional sense, um, a grant that is actually competed over by other organizations um, for, for some government funding, is a specially adapted housing assistive technology grant. This grant is managed by the Loan Guarantee Service and uh, has oversight by, by us in Specially Adapted Housing. And basically what we do, we're able to offer up to $200,000 um, a year for up to five companies who are doing research and development into new assistive technologies that um, the VA believes will assist Specially Adapted Housing eligible veterans. There's a wide range of different technologies we've had. This grant has been in effect since 2016. Um, since that time, we've actually awarded 14 different grants for different organizations, various organizations um, who are developing new products that we think will benefit our eligible veterans. A quick example of uh, who some of those companies are, uh, Auburn University. Um, was an awardee and they had a touch voice eye gaze control assistive technology that received the grant. Simply Home uh, LLC actually was able to link some technologies to the Amazon Echo. Um, St. Ambrose University, um, Prehensile Technologies, Phillips North America has had several. Um, an interesting one as well is the um, uh, University of Pittsburgh was doing some IOT work, some Internet of Things work to make sure that devices spoke together properly. But it's not just electronics, um, that type of technology. We also look at construction techniques as well. So for instance, Dignity Solutions is a firm that actually created a modular bathroom system that could be tacked on to an, assist, uh, an existing structure so we could really have an expedited, fully accessible bathroom without having to go through all the normal hassles of tearing out walls and things like that, which sometimes can take a, a long time. So some pretty interesting things out there and we're very proud of this grant. So um, I always like to go ahead and discuss the challenges uh, that surround this program as well. Whenever delivering a, 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 a program this complex into a, an environment as complex as actually adapting homes, uh, there are bound to be challenges. These are also opportunities that we've actually taken advantage of in the past, but one of the problems we have or one of the challenges we have obviously is the identification of qualified builders. Since uh, adaptive design and construction has been around now for decades, um, we, we would think it would be a little more advanced, uh, but the truth is the accessible design industry is still uh, a, a trend in a lot of areas of the country. Although we do have builders who've actually been uh, refining their, their craft and delivering adaptive homes and the concepts around universal design for many years, it's still difficult for folks in the construction trade to actually um, 
invest in that and actually see where they can actually make money and how it's profitable. One of our jobs, um, especially myself as a former home builder and a lot of the folks that we work with and especially Dabden Housing Program, is to be able to have that conversation with builders across the country and tradespeople and designers and architects about how uh, investing time uh, in specially adapted housing projects can actually be productive and how they can improve their processes to such a point where they can make money on these projects and reinvest. Once that's done, it's going to make it a lot easier for our veterans around the country to actually um, engage local builders and for those builders not to be afraid of taking on adaptive design types of projects. The next piece to that is development of plans that meet our requirements. Our requirements are not that strict and they're all based upon industry best practices. What the turning radius needs to be in front of the toilet. How many grab bars do you need? What's the pitch of a ramp? Things like that are things that we talk about all the time. Um, but uh, when builders actually sit down to actually develop plans and they're submitted for our approval, we have to make tweaks. And obviously we make these changes with the best interest of the veteran in mind and want to make sure that uh, they're getting a safe home and that their money is going as far as possible. We also try to stretch the grant dollars whenever, whenever possible, uh, looking at what the most, uh, the best return on investment is for the grant dollars based upon the adaptations that the veteran needs. Um, we've recently have some more um, uh, changes in legislation that are definitely going to help with how we stretch those grant dollars. Then of course, delivering adaptations in time to serve veterans, uh, especially those who are severely ill or, or terminal. Um, Adapting homes takes time. It's a process around it. Delivering the grant takes time, but we do everything we can possibly do to expedite the process. We've also uh, have an, uh, the, the opportunity and the ability to actually expedite grants for certain, for certain veterans as needed uh, based upon their terminal illness. Then of course, ensuring builders are informed about the program and the, pro bill and the program is profitable, which we touched on a minute ago. These are a few of the challenges we face. Obviously, uh, we face all these challenges head on and we do uh, an awful lot of outreach to go ahead and engage the building industry and uh, the organizations, the industry organizations like NAHB and NARI and the other organizations that are out there that represent the building trade to make sure all are informed on the program. Uh, I'd like to touch really quick on COVID-19 considerations. I think the Undersecretary did that as well. Um, within the SAH program right now, we have a moratorium on in-home visits, and the purpose of that is to protect our agents and to protect our veterans. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to ask, uh, how long it's going to last, but what we've done is we're, we're actually relying more and more on different types of technology and telecommunications so we can actually gain the information that we need to go ahead and approve projects for veterans who want to proceed with their grants, but without us having to actually put them at risk and engage them one-on-one. -on -one. We're ready to return. Um, the VA has already provided the, um, the PPE that our agents need to get back into homes and start meeting with veterans. Um, and we'll do it once it's safe. Once we're sure it's safe and uh, the medical industry and the CDC and, and the VA as a whole uh, determines it's safe to go back, at that time we'll do that. Until that time, we are not slowing down the delivery of specially adapted housing benefits. We're using all the tools at our disposal to go ahead and meet with veterans virtually, to inspect their homes virtually, to engage the building industry virtually, um, and address issues as we come up. And if we have to make uh, adjustments to our policy uh, to go ahead and make sure we continue to, to uh, deliver the benefit as needed, then, then we're doing that. Another good point too is we've actually been maximizing the use of the VA Video Connect tool. Fantastic tool originally brought up by VHA that can schedule meetings and we can have secure conversations via video with veterans um, just with a device, either with a, uh, with a desktop or a laptop or a, or a mobile device. Great tool and we've been maximizing the use of that tool to make sure that we can continue to provide service to our veterans. Now this is uh, something that I know is near and dear to BVA's heart. And um, again, this is, this is one of those areas where um, I don't think it could be understated the impact that BVA has on the lives of the veterans that they represent. Um, uh, Public Law 116-154 was passed into law on August 8th 
um, in this past year, uh, the Ryan Cools and Paul Benny Specialty Adaptive Housing Improvement Act of 2019 has a lot of impact. Um, specifically on the SAH program, we're very proud of it um, and we're very happy to be a part of it. The, the major clause in this, I think, uh, as far as BVA would be concerned, is uh, section two. Um, in essence, uh, what's happened is veterans that were previously eligible for SHA, the smaller grant, due to their diagnostic codes from blindness, will now be moving under and be eligible for the larger grant. And why is this important? Blindness adaptations uh, these days um, are mostly um, smart home technology. And because of the infancy uh, you know, of, of smart home technology uh, right now in the industry, it's very expensive. And what we were finding is the amount of money that was previously um, available through the smaller grant just was not able to afford the type of technology, smart home technology um, that, was, uh, that was needed from veterans. So we're really happy to hear about this. Um, in a nutshell, what this has done is it's taken um, a veteran who was previously eligible for an SHA grant <clears throat> for $18,000 for this year, and it's actually increased that grant um, to $80,000. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, it's gonna be $90,000 actually for FY19, <laughs> $90,000 and change, 90,364 to be specific. Um, so an enormous change for veterans there who have the blindness diagnostic codes and are in need of it um, and are found eligible for the larger grant. Section three um, of the grant is actually um, goes into effect on October 1st of this year, October 1st, 2020. And what that does is it's increasing the usages, previous usages, or at three, it's increasing the usages to six. So veterans who actually may have exhaust all three of their usages um, or had future plans and were concerned that they didn't wanna use their third usage now because they might need it later in life. Well, the good news is you're gonna be able to actually come back and use your, your grant six times um, as of October 1st. In addition, the post 9-11 grants we talked about before, the limited authority for that is going from 30 slots to 120 slots. That's another 90 veterans that we're gonna be able to serve um, who are in need of adaptations to the loss of a limb. Also, in addition, the increased uh, amounts of the grants. The dollar amount of the grants is going from what it currently is in $90,000 up to 98,000. 492, and for the smaller grants going from up to 19,733. In addition to that, section four, there's additional provision of additional SAH assistance. How it's currently written, that after 10 years, a veteran can come back for additional service, uh, for additional grant amounts, if they're in a home that has not previously been adapted. Uh, there are still some details of that plan. Um, and this will not go into effect until October 1st of 2030. I should also state that section two of this grant that we spoke about um, is in effect immediately as of the signing of the bill. So as of August 8th um, is when this goes into effect. So um, questions uh, on the screen here is our direct email address. Uh, please write it down. If uh, anyone has questions about the program, general questions or specific questions about your case. Um, and if you don't have the number of your local regional loan center, you need to speak to us, please use our general email box, sahinfo.vbaco at va.gov. You can also look to our website, the link is right here, or you can just Google VA Specially Adapted Housing. On that website, you'll find the details of our grants, and you'll also be able to download the Specially Adapted Housing Handbook for Design. It's a 60-page book that walks through all the entitlements. Um, there'll be an updated version coming out soon, actually, based upon uh, recent statutory changes, but you can always get that book. You can download it, or if we happen to see you at a conference and we bump into you, we'll usually have hard copies with us, and we can pass them on to you as well. So with that said, um, that's my presentation. I would love to address uh, any questions the group might have. Yes, this is Jim Vale. Uh, great presentation, uh, very informative. Uh, a couple of questions here. Um, 
Uh, do you know why there was a limit to the number of post 9-11 grants? The, um, the assumption has to be it was a matter of funding at the time. So when it originally came out, the 30 grants were authorized. Um, we, uh, I mean, prior to that, we had none. So we were very happy to see it and we're happy to see it go up to 120. But um, as far as the, uh, the limit, uh, rather than maximizing the use, um, it, it, the assumption it was the funding was due to funding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question, if you've already used uh, an SHA grant, can you apply and, and receive the SAH grant if you're- Absolutely. Okay. Yes, you can. And um, and actually right now what we have is, so historically we actually have veterans who have been using their, um, their SHA grant previously, um, and then their conditions may have worsened and they became eligible for the larger grant. So when that happens, you actually start fresh. You might complete the project you're working on, but you'll start fresh actually uh, as you need your net next adaptation project and you'll start over with more usages and the entire new entitlement for the new pot of money. And that'll be the same thing now actually as we move into um, the, uh, the transition of veterans with the blindness diagnostic codes from the small grant to the larger grant as well. Great. All right, next question. Can you can you use any of these grants or the, the SAH or the SHA uh, with the HISA grant at the same time? Yes, yes you can. And then that's one of the beautiful things too. Um, you know, the VA knew that this would become one of the benefits actually of actually being able to combine these grants. So we worked very closely and we continue to work very closely with the prosthetics group. When we find a veteran who actually uh, is either eligible for HISA or SAH, we make sure we proactively reach out to them too. And actually during our initial interview process, a couple of the steps we provide is inquiring if they've heard of HISA and providing them the application, as well as if they've heard of vocational rehabilitation and employment's independent living grant, and we'll provide the application actually at the initial interview as well. And we can definitely stack those grants. Um, where you go around the country makes a big difference for how far this money goes. If I'm, if I'm doing a bathroom adaptation in Muskogee, Oklahoma, the cost is, is X. If I'm doing that same thing in San Francisco, the cost is Y, and they can be dramatically different. So we have been provided the flexibility by the VA actually to go ahead and be able to stack those grants as needed to make sure we can provide the adaptations that the veteran needs. Great. Um, the HISA grant, is that a one-time grant? It is, yeah. You have a lifetime um, eligibility of six thousand eight hundred dollars if you have a fifty percent eligibility or higher. If you're forty percent or less, that amount is two thousand dollars. And that's a another one. You can actually apply for HISA via eBenefits, or you can reach out to the local VA medical center for an application uh, for HISA. Great. Okay, I got a question here from um, Helen McDevitt. Uh, she's not clear on step one to start application process for grant. Can you explain? what veterans should do first. Absolutely. The easiest thing to do is go on to eBenefits and submit a 4555 or an SAH application. You can do it from eBenefits. It takes only a minute. There are only a couple pieces of information we need uh, to go ahead and submit that and that will kick off the rating process. If you choose, you could also download the 4555 form from the internet and go ahead and just fill it out and mail it in um, either way and or drop it off physically at your local VA medical center. Either way, that is the initial requirement for you to go ahead and apply for the benefit. Um, and uh, at that point, it'll kick off the rating process with compensation service and then they'll determine whether or not you're eligible for the benefit. Now, once that rating process is completed, and that's when the that's when the application comes back to us, within a day or two, you'll be contacted by, from a specially adapted housing agent on our staff, and they'll be able to walk you through the rest of the process to schedule an initial interview. So there are several ways for you to go ahead and get it in. E-benefits is the fastest and easiest, but if you don't have an account, you can always download a paper application. And also, if you have ever, ever any trouble with that, you can always reach out to a veteran service organization like BVA or one of the other groups in the area who can definitely assist you to get the application submitted. Great, thank you. All and, right, yeah, uh, also, another Donald. question. Um, yeah, it's Don. I was just gonna oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I just wanna say, hey, Jason, thank you so much for the presentation. You're welcome for the job security, by the way, because they worked hard to make sure that you were good to go for the future. So, um, but, I, I, but, but again, uh, the other piece is, is that Tracy Farrow is out there. We're just going to go ahead and ask Tracy to unmute. He's got his hand up. So Tracy, 
If you'll unmute and go ahead and ask Jason your question, sir. Question and answer. Okay. Two unread uh, questions. Question I got is concerning uh, service connection uh, with the different grants and everything, because as legally blind, we're catastrophic. So a lot of benefits that normally would not apply do apply simply because we're, we're considered catastrophic. So the service connection and what types of grants uh, would, would be authorized. And also you touched on uh, smart homes, you know, upgrading a home to a smart home, because that's primarily if we have good mobility, we need that internet Wi-Fi type access for appliances, thermostats, uh, security systems, lighting, you know, where it's it's not really invasive into the structure of a house, but it is a lot of electronic um, upgrades. Right, absolutely. Um, I so to your to your first question, as far as the uh, which which um, which grant you might be. Uh, uh, eligible for that all starts with the application process. Obviously, the SH program we don't determine eligibility, but what we do is we deliver the benefits. Um, I know that uh, based upon the diagnostic codes that we are we find eligibility for within within. Um, the SAH program, uh, those veterans will now be eligible for the larger grant. Uh, and I'm sure there's also similar requirements for vr &E and for HISA as well. Um, That's regardless of service connection. HISA specifically. Um, so for SAH, it's uh, actually service connected only. Um, okay. vr &E, I believe is also service connected, but they have some other variables in there. And the beautiful thing about the VRNE program too is that they'll perform a, a thorough um, living in place assessment is what they do um, of your home and your employability and your mobility too. And uh, they'll be able to speak to eligibility for, for VRNE. For HISA, yeah, you can have 40% um, and less does not have to be service connected for you to be able to go ahead and get that benefit. And that benefit is $2,000. Okay. To your next point about smart home technology, it's a uh, it's a very exciting industry. Uh, we're working with companies like Control Four and other nonprofits like uh, Living in Place Institute and and a whole bunch more. Just to just mention a few, and obviously the Brian Rehabilitation Services and VHA, we're working very closely with them as well because they have a myriad of programs, um, as well as the assistive technology branches within VHA also, who specialize in smart home technology. Some of it, some of which can actually be issued as durable medical equipment from the VA. Uh, so it's a fantastic industry and I tell you the we're so excited about um, this increase in, in grant amount that's now available to our veterans suffering from blindness too because this technology is expensive and um, we're at the uh, International Builder Show and the National Kitchen Bath Show every year and the other technology shows and Cedia and everything and we're looking at all this wonderful technology. The good news is as it becomes more prolific, um, the costs begin to go down uh, and we can actually start delivering maybe a comprehensive smart home solution for veterans uh, who, who need it specifically. So was there... Um, FaceTime is launched in the back. No. Was there a question specific about the smart home technology or um, just a general comment? Well, just in general, uh, for example, in my house, you know, I couldn't even turn my oven on. So I did renovate my kitchen and everything. I did buy a, a Wi-Fi controllable oven, which works with Alexa, which is Zoom. a US. wonderful product. Zoom. Right. Um, you know, washing and dryers. Uh, I, I, three months later, unfortunately, they went out and I didn't get the Wi-Fi controlled ones. I wish I had because, mm -hmm. you know, then I could do things. There's a lot of stuff though that in my own house I've done um, on my own to upgrade which has, you know, a lot of things, assistive technology like that are um, made for lazy people, I say, but they work great for the blind. <laughs> right. Well, and you, you also I, I, touched I on um, security problem. systems. Uh, the fact that security systems are not, are not inexpensive either. And you have other things to consider when, um, when uh, you want to feel more secure in your home and to have a uh, complete security system for your home that makes you feel that way that's that costs money and um we're we're very excited and again we're we're working uh, we'll be continuing to work closely with with bva on their recommended technologies and what they feel maybe the minimum requirements are that veterans uh who have these disabilities should be looking for 
Um, but we're, uh, again, we're very excited and we think this new statute is gonna, um, is gonna pay off very well for our veterans who need these smart home adaptations. Wonderful, thank you. My pleasure, yeah. Jason, can you clarify as far as um, renewing the grant in 2030? Yes. Yeah. The uh, so the um, uh, the new statute um, states that uh, a veteran will be able to come back after after ten years um, of their previous use, and based upon when the law was passed, that would be October first, twenty thirty, was the first time we'd be able to see any of these cases. So veterans who have either exhausted their grant or not exhausted their grant um, may be eligible if they need additional funds for adaptations and they're in a new home which hasn't been previously adapted and this was based upon I think the um, obviously we we know the stories um, we've heard from the sponsors of the bill specifically who uh, had already adapted their home then 10 years later they're in a new house and they've already exhausted all their money and their usages and they couldn't come back and uh, so this bill is supposed to actually help satisfy some of that need. So veterans who are in a new home um, who will need additional adaptations will have the benefit of getting up to 50% of the maximum grant that's available at that time, um, uh, you know, based upon their need. So uh, we're, again, that's something that we're very excited about and we hope a lot of veterans are able to benefit from that as well. Okay, great. Um, well, I think we're, uh... We're at 45 minutes, so we're up, we're at the end of our, our time. But um, we'd like to thank you for, for joining us. It's been very informative, and we really appreciate the, the work that you do for our veterans. Thank you, Jim. It, it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to um, spend some time with uh, BVA. Um, and I look forward to closing, uh, working very closely within the future you know, uh, on these new statutory changes and making sure that our veterans can, uh, can really benefit from the use of these grants. Thank you so much, Jason. It would have been nice to have you in person, but this is the next best thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thanks so much. It was very comprehensive and informative. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having thank me. And thank you for every, everyone that's joined us today and, and throughout the time that we've done these. Um, hopefully we can do some more. Um, thanks again. And um, this, this, kinda, this completes our August Zoom sessions. And, uh, and we'll look forward to meeting you again, Jason. Thanks for the great presentation.